Welcome back to another episode of Tourpreneur. My name is Mitch Bach, and today's topic, once again, is storytelling. If you haven't listened to part one of this two-part series, then I would recommend going back and listening first to episode 183. I'm back with my two guests, which are two tour guides, Jazz Dotton and Lee Jameson, both of whom spend a lot of time thinking not only about the craft of storytelling, which we talked about in a great discussion last week, but also content. What kinds of information should you be looking for? How do you tell the whole story of a destination, the full, complete picture of the history of a place? And how do you do it in a way that connects truly with your audience? Throughout this episode, you'll be hearing not only from our two guests, but also from your fellow Tourpreneur community members who have submitted recordings of their thoughts about storytelling, and you'll be hearing from them throughout the episode as well. So let's get started. My name is Donna Burton. I'm from Donna the Astronomer. What makes a great storyteller is someone who is enthusiastic and passionate about their subject and has the ability to communicate it in a way that reaches all people in different age groups. The passion and enthusiasm comes across and then the storytelling becomes much more simple. Lee Jamison, thank you so much for returning to Tourpreneur. On our last episode, we talked a lot about the craft of storytelling, how to weave a narrative arc that also leaves room for conversation and improvisation. But I want to switch gears now. I want to talk about tour content. You lead a lot of tours up and down the United States, East Coast, Washington, D.C., New York City, these places with rich and dense histories. And so I'm wondering if you could begin by just telling me about how you think about deciding which story to tell, whose story, where do you start in understanding what you should be talking about as a guide on an American history tour? There is no single story to anywhere we go. There is a traditional line that is talked about. Um, There is a traditional canon um, that is expected. And I do not advocate erasing it and tossing it out the window. What I do advocate though is um, letting letting yourself take the moment to learn about every other story that's happening at the same time. I'll go back to George Washington. I'm a fan. I used to work at Mount Vernon as you know uh, and I'm a fan of George. Uh, I think his sense of uh, leadership at the beginning of the great experiment is worthy of sharing and talking about and learning more about. And George Washington was one of more than 300 people that were living and working at the Mount Vernon estate. That means that there are more than 300 other stories to be talking about. We know there were 317 enslaved people. We know that 41 of those 317 were rented from other farms. So already we've got a layer of interest Um, We know Martha also worked and lived at Mount Vernon. We know that there were white and black overseers. We know that there was a a German uh, wife to the gardener that was living there. What was her life like? So I am a huge believer in acknowledging and learning about the additional threads in the tapestry. Um, Nobody likes except to Rothko. Um, Nobody likes a single color splashed all over everything. We want to have the nuance and the deepening. I think everything that you learn about the side stories, the the previously marginalized voices that we have an opportunity to bring into the center focus enhances that traditional line of story, does not negate or take away. It makes it deeper and richer. So the single story is just one out of all of them that we get to learn about and share. Your invocation of the artist Mark Rothko is actually perfect because he would never say it's a single splash of color. He would say, look at it. 
dive in, look at the edges, and you start to see an entire world of complexity and mystery and difficulty and ambiguity. And I think that's the perfect metaphor is that so often we think, especially as a new guide, I remember thinking I was a new guide in Paris and I was an American. Everything I said was blasphemous just because of my accent. And so I quickly latched on to what I thought was the story of the history of France. And I remember one of my real aha moments as a guide was when I was working as a licensed guide, walking down the street with a group, and I was speaking about the lived experience of the Roma people that uh, congregate at the entrances and exits of the Paris Metro. And I had a local Paris guide stop me in the middle of my tour and tell me, don't be talking about this to the guests. Don't, that's, that's not part of a Paris tour. I was scolded for going outside of the boundaries of what had been codified as the way to talk about a place. And I think if anything, one of the things that this pandemic, especially in the context of the United States, has done is given us all time to open our eyes to the blind spots within the way in which we've spoken about places. And like you said, that there is no single story or that if there is a single story, call it American capital A history, capital H, in that is included the multiplicity of views of people, especially the marginalized who traditionally don't show up in, in, in those textbooks. Absolutely. Uh, and the scolding isn't going to stop because um, there will be uh, compatriots in the industry who feel that um, we only have a finite amount of time. And so we need to focus on the neutral story. Um, also, we don't want to rock the boat and make any of our guests feel uncomfortable. Um, but as, as, as you're aware, uh, I work with Margie Sutherland with 52% Productions and we do not believe in neutral. There is no such thing as neutral. Neutral is simply a single story. And if you have a diverse group of guests and we always have diverse groups of guests sitting in front of us, then, then you are doing a disservice to the broader story. Um, and um, you would, if, if our guests don't hear the panoply of story from us, then where are they going to get it? Oftentimes, the tour guide on a guided tour is the only, quote unquote, real New Yorker, real DC denizen uh, that they're going to meet. And so you actually do take on this certain responsibility for being the overall storyteller of a culture, of a place, often of cultures and places and contexts that aren't yours. And so I was wondering, what's, what's your advice or what's your thoughts on the ability of a non-marginalized individual to talk about the story of an other? Absolutely. Uh, it, uh, my favorite story to talk about in Washington, D.C., given the chance, um, is to talk about uh, the largest attempted claim for freedom in American history uh, in 1848 with the Pearl and 77 enslaved people of Washington, D.C. who attempted to escape. Um, they were caught and, and many of them were sold away from the area and away from family. And on board the ship, were the Edmondsons, a um, number of the Edmondson siblings, including two sisters, um, Mary and Emily. And, and I, I tell that story every, every chance I can. Um, it is a story about family love. It is a story about overcoming odds. It is a story about embracing hope. Um, and when I tell it as, as a white woman, a white cis woman, um, telling a story about uh, where, the, where the key players in the story are 77 enslaved people. Uh, I am sensitive to my relationship with our American history and sensitive to how my language um, and tone uh, can be perceived and received um, by my guests. Um, it is not a story that I uh, share um, without the research. Um, 
I have to know that I know what I know so that if there is a moment of challenge, I have the answers of the information that I don't always put into the story to keep the story whole and clean and engaging and emotional. Um, I am also always receptive to listening to a guest who has a concern or a question. So it is about choosing language. It is about knowing my, my research and is about being receptive to listening after my time in the spotlight is done. Because honestly, these stories that I share, whether it's about George or it's about Mary and Emily Edmondson, they're, they're not about me. <laughs> no matter how much I love applause and I love applause, it's about the Edmondsons, or it's about George Washington, or it's about um, uh, Clara Barton, or it's about, and pick, pick somebody you love. It's not about me. And so it, it's, it's about how I am receptive to listening through the story and after the story. Talk to me about the business proposition and all of this that ultimately you're running a business, you want to sell seats, you want to give the customer what they want, you want to make sure that you're not delivering something that is so different from their expectations that they're not exactly upset, but turned off by the idea of what they're getting versus what they thought they were getting. Where, as a storyteller, can you create the types of bridges and connections that are necessary to make sure that that sort of bad business proposition doesn't happen? Absolutely. That's, um, that's a question I get a lot uh, in the consulting that I do. But what about our tips? <laughs> I get it. I feed on my, I got to pay my rent too. Um, language choice is always really important. Um, I, th I think that, uh, and language changes and it changes fast. So it is in our best industry interest to be paying attention to things like that. Um, the, the other thing is I rarely start an experience with, a, with an explosive um, story that is going to put somebody on the defensive. We live in very tricky times, um, very interesting moment. And so it is in my best interest not to start rocking the boat. Um, I try and suss out who my audience is in the first 15-ish minutes, 10 to 15-ish minutes to really find out how receptive they're going to be. You gotta know your audience. Um, and that lets me know how filtered or unfiltered my language choices are going to be and how long I'm going to develop a story or, because you can take a story and knock it down to your three fun facts. And those facts tend to be, because they are less emotionally engaging, tend to be um, an easier way to get the same story out without story-fying it, I guess. So, so that, that's really important also. Um, now, some people might take it as their mission to be explosive from top to tail, but uh, it's advertised that way. You know, if, if you're advertising, you're going to be taken on the most explosive, mind-blowing, um, uh, 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 progressive tour of downtown Manhattan, of lower Manhattan, of the financial district you've ever had in your life, then you know that walking in. <laughs> you know, if you're looking for it, it's there. But if you're on a more um, mixed adventure, as, as a tour guide, I take that moment to really ask those questions of my guests on why they're here and why they've chosen this. And, and people want to share their life with you. <laughs> and so take take those tidbits on whether or not you're going to be taking them through human origins in the natural history museum, or you're just going to be running out of time and spending more time on something else that's less explosive. There's again, it's going back to the tempo of the tour, the tempo of the tour. I think there's 
a corollary point to this idea as well, which is when you're being your most human with another group of humans, which is what you're advocating for, getting to know human beings and seeing where they're at with things. Uh, that's, that's it's, It should be obvious, but in some ways it's revolutionary in terms of how we think about the development of our material. On that same level, humans like humans. They like hearing human-based stories, the stories of individuals and not statistics and your opinions about those statistics or general blanket statements. We don't like that in any, in any context. So why would we like it here? I also think it's really important to remember as tour guides that our guests um, are on vacation and, and that also should be honored. They're taking a tour, let's say, you know, as you, as you mentioned, I do museum tours. Um, when, when they book with me, they want the information. But I also acknowledge that they are on vacation. And I don't like being placed on the defensive when I am on holiday. So um, unless, I, again, I've specifically signed up for something that is going to be um, down that version of the path, that is, it, it is worth honoring that somebody is on holiday. And with that, Lee, I'm going to honor the fact that you deserve a holiday. And thank you again for your insights and for joining us. My name's Christina. I'm from Inverted Atlas. What makes a guide a great storyteller? I think the first thing is to keep things concise. Not overloading people with facts is definitely a good start. But I think most of all, when you think of great stories, we usually think of books or maybe even the TV. That's because the person watching or reading is completely immersed in what they're reading or what they're watching and they're they're not sort of thinking about anything else. I think a good guide needs to be able to do that. Um, They need to be totally immersed. And I think one way they can do that is um, by actually telling a story of, you know, about the place and moving around the site moving around where they are and including parts of the site in their story rather than just sort of standing there and expecting people to listen. For example, with archaeological sites, I guess, you know, my business, that's that's um, where I'm coming from. If you move around, say, the site of Troy in Turkey, um, you can include the Trojan War in your guiding and say this is where you know Hector and Achilles fought on this beach supposedly and this is where Priam the king of Troy would have watched it from and then you can stand in the little Roman theatre and stand on the stage and tell the rest of the story and totally immerse the group in what's what's happened here. We're back for this second part of our episode with Jazz Dotton. Jazz, last week, we talked a lot about crafting a narrative on your tour based on the kind of conversation and feedback you're getting from your guests. I want to shift gears now to the content that you've been creating. I was wondering if you could share a little bit of your experience creating a YouTube channel that specifically is looking at the black history of the state of Massachusetts where you live. So I started a YouTube channel in 2020 in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, I was unemployed at the time, but my background was in, in or is in travel and tourism. And I thought seeing what was happening in the country and people taking an interest in learning Black history, that this would be a good time for me to share it. So I decided to create a YouTube channel where I could stand in locations around Massachusetts and share stories that people Uh, do not regularly hear or wouldn't know is there just in passing because there are not many signs or any signs at all. Talk to me more about that process then of unearthing Black gems, these gems of stories in a context in which they've needed to be unearthed. What has that process been like for you? It's been eye-opening. I So when the pandemic started, I was curious about the injustice taking place throughout the country and 
while I could have just looked at like the history from like 2000 and onward, I decided, okay, let me just go all the way back, like to the earliest black people to arrive in Massachusetts so that we can get really grounded in like as far back as we can go. So when I found out that the first American slave ship came or was built in Massachusetts in Marblehead and departed from like along the Salem shoreline, I thought to myself, holy guacamole, <laughs> that is insane. And how can I tell people this in a way that they'll remember it and not take it personal? So I try to tell things in a way that's somewhat amusing based off of my tone of voice, based off of my expressions. Um, and with this YouTube channel, it's about being in the place. So you can see this is where it happened. This is what it looks like today. That's a really interesting point that in some ways you're using your your wide smile, your bubbly personality to, would you say, form a connection with an audience that then you can use to sort of go deeper places with them? Definitely. I think my uh, persona, I don't want to say disarm, but it does disarm people. It makes them comfortable because I'm a friendly person and it makes what I have to say uh, palatable. I think people feel comfortable based off of my expression. And I also try and read other people's body language and expressions when I'm physically with them. In actual tour guiding, I do very much look and see if people are engaged. Are they looking at me? Are they looking at what I'm talking about? Are they on their phones? Like, what's going on? And then shift based off of what I see is happening. In your interactions with actual people, not viewers, but human beings that are, that are in front of you, what are some of the experiences that you've had of sharing this different side of history that then maybe they're used to hearing? Well, recently, relatively recently, in March, I had a group of people visiting from the Midwest. Um, they were students, so they were teenagers, and I shared with them as we walked through Faneuil Hall the history of who Peter Faneuil was, as, since he was a person who traded in slaves and in products that helped uh, create revenue throughout the triangle trade, and I kind of tried to say it in a slower pace, more uh, more solemn, I guess you could say. And the students kind of, they, they were very focused and intent listening to the words I had to say. And they understood like, wow, this is a predicament that this building is named after a guy that was involved with uh, enslaving individuals like this is not great history but we want clam chowder so how do we <laughs> how do we deal with this reality right now I mean step one is just knowing it and step two is thinking hmm, should we speak up should we ask for change now you of course are a person of color and a lot of tour guides aren't and I'm wondering if you have any tips for operators for guides that are confronting sides of their particular region or city or country's history and then communicating it to an audience that you're right might just be looking for a bowl of clam chowder how do you how do you go about creating those bridges or creating that connection that facilitates this this deeper dialogue i think my approach has just been trying to paint a a complete picture because I, when people come to Boston, I will tell them, you know, the main stories that have been shared throughout decades of history. Like I'll tell them about Paul Revere and Sam Adams, like make sure to tell those stories, but kind of look at the other side of the picture. Like who, who are the other people that they were dealing with? Like the women in the colony, the black people in the colony, indigenous people. Like I try to make sure it's fully inclusive so that way people can decide what they want to do with these stories. They may not agree, but I'm telling the complete story. When you are researching the stories of a place like Boston, how did you go about making sure that the story is complete or discovering these gems? Where, where are you finding this material? Because I think a lot of guidebooks don't go into this terrain. Am I wrong? True. No, you're right. Yeah. Guidebooks 
are only so large, <laughs> which is why I might go into academic journals or I'll visit the historical society's website to see like what other information do they have in this time period that can complement what I've learned in guidebooks. Like I'm never satisfied with just hearing a white man's story. There's always usually a woman or a person of color that is somewhere in the mix. Um, I found very helpful this book by a woman named Rosalyn Delores Elder. She wrote a, a book specifically about African-American heritage in Massachusetts. I used that book as I was looking at other guidebooks um, to kind of piece together the missing parts. Um, and then also going on to Historical Society's website, as I mentioned, like they have great timelines on there that include people of color. And I work at a university. One of the benefits is going in academic journals. I love the journals. But fun fact, if you find like a journal that you would like to read, oftentimes you can just email the author and ask if they'd be willing to share it. So don't feel intimidated by those fees you see on there. That is a brilliant tip. I actually learned that tip myself on TikTok of all places. <laughs> yes, that, <TikTok>. <laughs> Which <laughs> is another podcast episode. <laughs> but I have to say that uh, academics often are as angry at academic journals as uh, <laughs> the true. readers of them are, and they're very willing to send you that PDF yeah. of something that they're really interested in. Mm -hmm. yeah, it just stinks how this information is like gatekeeped. Like you got to release it so that the public can understand the reality of the world we live in. So talk to me a little bit, just out of curiosity, about some of the things that you've unearthed about a city like Boston, Massachusetts, or or Cambridge, where uh, I know you, a lot of your videos are focused. What have you discovered, and and what sort of blew your mind about the way in which the historical terrain shifted as you explored it? Yeah, I think in Boston, in the north end, I was surprised to to learn a couple of specific Black stories. I learned about Onesimus, who was a Black man who um, was brought to Boston and give, given as a gift to a, 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 to a, a, a reverend, a Reverend uh, Cotton Mather, who was involved with the Salem Witch Trials. So it was just interesting to hear that Cotton Mather's conversation with this man that he enslaved led to, um, to creating like a early stage of a vaccine essentially for the smallpox, I was amazed to hear like, wow, this conversation with the individual led to this, this cure that helped prevent the spread of this disease. And it also, I found it interesting because I was thinking about the dynamics of slavery that, oh, okay, so you're having like casual conversations with these people that you've enslaved. Hmm. And you're actually believing what they have to say. Hmm. Very interesting because uh, I guess I think about how slavery was taught back when I was in grade school, and it was very much slavery was in the South. It was terrible. There were whips. Let's not talk any further about this. <laughs> but slavery was so nuanced, depending on where it was in the country, who were the people that enslaved individuals, for what purpose were they uh, enslaved? Because there were like a lot of servants up in the Boston area. And I was fascinated to learn about the royal house and slave quarters because that's the only known slave quarters, like house that exists up in the north of, uh, of, um, of the United States. That was really interesting to be able to walk through there and see the different um, items that they've been able to pull up from archaeological digs. There's like so many little things that I didn't really know were physically here from the 1700s. What does a tour operator do with something like a food tour that really doesn't specifically dive into this type of material or this type of terrain? Do they, are you asking them to sort of re rethink their tour, rethink their lens on history, on food? Where, 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 where do you, where do you see those kinds of tours or a ghost tour or something fitting into kind of this project of, of rethinking American history or unearthing these types of new perspectives? I think there's an opportunity to look at expanding the stories. I mean, from a food tour perspective, I love food. I love food tours. I think there's a way to talk about how cuisine travels from one culture to another. I mean, while you might be talking about, uh, 
let's see, you could be talking about Chinese food, you could be having dumplings and oh, wait, let's talk about Peking raviolis. Why are they called that? I just learned recently that Peking raviolis, their name kind of came from trying to get Italians to eat Chinese food. <laughs> so like there's ways to connect across cultures as you're serving or providing people cuisine throughout the, the food tours. Um, and ghost tours, I mean, people die. <laughs> people of different backgrounds, different races. We all leave this earth eventually. Like, please, you can't tell me you can't find a story of an indigenous person, a black person, Asian person to include in your tours. That's nuts. Like, come on. Oh my <laughs> gosh, I love that. You need a diversity of ghosts. You yes. Know, like, that every, the, everybody's haunting you. When you are talking about the history of a specific site and there's nothing to point to there's no sculpture there's no building how do you think about the way you frame a narrative when when your tour doesn't really have something to see specifically hmm. i like to draw on the imagination like i might have the group close their eyes and try and picture what the space would have looked like in the 1950s or whatever when xyz building was here or say um say it's like a weather related thing like can you imagine like a storm cloud coming over your head and pouring down the rain non-stop and what that would have been like as you're rushing to get to your car and da da da, da. like whatever the story is like i'll try and paint a picture so that people can imagine it, feel it, sense it, smell it, and try and imagine what the setting was like. Or if I have technology, I can show them on my iPad or play an audio clip. Depends on what it is. Yeah, actually, I think sometimes your ability to paint with words and get a guest to imagine can be more powerful than just showing them that image or playing them that 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 audio clip or something. So I love that advice of of not just saying there used to be a building here, but close your eyes and I'm going to build that building for you in your mind. As a guide of color and a person working in the tourism industry uh, of color, what has your experience been participating in 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 the industry? I always feel like I am the black sheep in the room, but it is what it is. Someone has to do it. So I, I go into the room and I'm fully aware that I may be the only person of color and maybe the only woman of color in the room. And I just, I recognize it. And as I have conversations with people, I realize that individuals are coming from a different place understanding of the world than I am and depending on reactions to <laughs> reactions to easy things I may present from a person of color's perspective then I decide whether I want to approach a conversation on like making things more diverse I try to read the room like you know I don't just jump in the pool of water I put my toe in <laughs> and then see how much of a conversation I can have Jazz, thank you so much for dipping your toe in the waters of Tourpreneur and sharing your wisdom. My name is Ritik from Trokus, travel with locals in India. And to answer what makes a guide a great storyteller, I would say having a clear blueprint of the story in your head and thinking that the story is like a movie going on and you're describing it with a passion in your voice the right tonality and effective expressions, it will create an instant connection between you and the audience. Make it more and more interactive using questions. Especially don't go into a lot of details, you might lose their interest and attention since they won't be able to connect the dots and it is very tough to gain it back. Don't assume that they know stuff they don't know. Let them ask questions, be as open and make it just a fun, normal conversation and have fun. That is the secret to have a great tour. Just make them happy. That concludes our two-part 
discussion with Jazz and Lee on storytelling. It won't be the last time that we address this incredibly dense and deep and important topic. And whenever you hear my voice, it's probably going to be a topic on the guest experience, whether it's storytelling or designing a great experience or just even understanding the narrative that you're sharing over the course of the entire customer journey from your social media to the final email you send. It all goes into sharing your passion in a way that truly connects with your audience. For more information on this and much more, always make sure you go to tourpreneur.com. Thank you.